Well, good day, everyone, and uh, or good evening, as the case may be for me. And uh, I'd like to welcome you guys uh, to The Ancient Scholar. This is going to be part two in a series of videos discussing the Advanced Emergency Medical Technician Cognitive Examination uh, through the National Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians. This is, uh, again, part two in a series. Um, so I kind of pick up where I left off, and uh, where I left off is actually uh, taking the exam. So uh, just a quick review, as I stated, it's going to be 135 questions. Uh, you're going to have 135 minutes. That'll give you a minute per question. Uh, you are able to take breaks during the exam. However, the timer does not stop during the break. Um, so you are still being timed, even though you get, get to take a break. So keep that in mind if you have to, to do so. Um, so now what I want to do is, based on my experience, in my experience, taking an exam only, um, I want to cover some, um, some of the content areas, again, uh, due to, to legal and ethical issues, um, and I believe the fact that you actually sign saying, hey, I'm not going to talk about the exact questions I saw on this exam, um, I can't discuss specific questions or my or the answers that I chose for specific questions. Uh, first of all, I don't get to see all the answers for the, those questions, so um, do I really know that I'm right or wrong? No. Um, what I do know is, at this point, that I passed the examination, um, so I have a reasonable idea, hopefully, of uh, some of the content that you may want to look at and study up on, and so that's kind of the angle that I'll take here with this uh, review, if you want to call it a review. Um, again, probably everybody is going to get a different exam because there's a bank, more than likely, of several thousand questions. So um, the 135 questions that I got, probably not going to be the 135 questions that somebody else would get. Um, so in that sense, it's also really not particularly helpful to talk about specific questions anyway. Um, but I just kind of want to be very clear on uh, what I'll actually be doing with review. Okay, so the, the first uh, concept, uh, the first area, content area, I wanted to just quickly discuss is talking um, about EMS operations. Um, I would definitely kind of take a look at um, uh, EMS safety, specifically when it comes to uh, driving an ambulance. Uh, for example, you know, where do most crashes occur? You know, where are the most dangerous areas? Um, for us, and intuitively, I think we know this, you know, things like intersections, for example. You know, we know lots of crashes happen at intersections, and and we know, you know, we've seen, it's all over YouTube, all these videos of, you know, emergency vehicles going through intersections and getting hit. These are obviously a very dangerous area. Um, you know, what con types of weather um, might I have more crashes in? Um, the answer may kind of surprise you, actually. Um, when we talk about, you know, what types of weather. Um, it's not necessarily bad weather where we have lots of crashes occurring. Um, so just some operational uh, material you might want to take a look at. Um, definitely you want to take a look at, and this is somewhat of an operational, um, operational toxicology hazmat uh, kind of issue. Um, you, you definitely want to be able to identify uh, some of the agents uh, that can be used in, you know, a weapons of mass destruction or in what they call an NBC, nuclear biological chemical um, attack, and generally know what some of these major agents are. You know, what are, for example, what are types of nerve agents? You know, sarin, VX, VD. You know, know that those are nerve agents. Know that anthrax maybe is, 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 a, is a bacteria. Um, you know, what, it, what about mustard gas? What about cyanide? What about vesicants? Um, and what do these agents generally do, and what are some of the treatments available for uh, some of these agents? There are some specific treatments. For example, um, one that comes to mind is the Mark I kit. Um, when talking about nerve agent or organophosphate, well, nerve agents are basically organophosphate molecules, organophosphate um, exposure. And, and alongside with that, be able to identify the cardinal signs and symptoms of certain um, toxidromes, you know, uh, for example, uh, narcotic overdose. You know, what does somebody with a narcotic overdose look like? Well, they, respiratory depression, they're 
they have um, meiosis, their, their pupils are constricted, um, they have um, depressed mentation perhaps, um, and so on and so forth. However, somebody experiencing a cholinergic crisis from, say, um, organophosphate overdose, you know, exposure to insecticide or nerve agent, may have some crossover signs and symptoms, right? If you remember um, sludge, um, salivation, lactation, urination, defecation, GI, um, upset, emesis, and so on, um, there are some other things associated with cholinergic crisis, like meiosis. Well, narcotics cause meiosis, cholinergic crisis can cause meiosis, so you want to be a very good detective and you want to be able to compare and contrast the cardinal findings for some of these toxidromes. Um, definitely kind of know the basic pathophysiology of the major uh, illnesses and diseases that you run into, for example, uh, you know, pneumonia. You know, what's the basic pathophysiology of pneumonia? You know, is it the bacterial causes, fungal causes, viral causes. What is someone with pneumonia? You know, how do they present? You know, they have a fever. Right? They have cough, chills. Um, you know, they have an acute um, infective process. You know, occurring in their lungs. And how does that differ from, say, someone with congestive heart failure? You know, m maybe the lung sounds are similar, but are there profound differences um, between these uh, these two types of pulmonary disorders? Um, being able to identify the patho basic pathophysiology of uh, um, obstructive lung diseases, for example, uh, asthma. You know, what are some of the cardinal types of pathophysiology like bronchoconstriction, uh, airway inflammation, mu uh, the production of mucus plugs, and how does maybe that differ from, say, someone with emphysema or someone with chronic bronchitis? You know, there's some, obviously they're all obstructive diseases, there's some similarities, but there are also some differences as well in being able to kind of contrast, compare and contrast those different diseases uh, might be very helpful. Um, definitely review your medical terminology, okay? When we talk about root words, prefix, suffix, and um, be able to dissect words and develop a, a good understanding of what certain words mean. For example, uh, I'll just pull out a word, uh, let's say bronchoscopy, for example. Well, you know, that's not something we run into. You know, what is a bronchoscopy? You know, maybe, maybe, maybe I've never seen it, but with my, my knowledge of medical terminology, can I look at something like bronchoscopy and go, okay, so um, oscopy is using a scope and looking at something through, through a scope. Um, you know, through an instrument that has a camera on it, more than likely. Okay, so I'm looking at something, and then bronch, well, you need to recognize that bronch refers to what? Well, the bronchi and the bronchioles of the lungs. Oh, okay, bronchoscopy is literally taking a scope and looking into the, the bronchi and bronchioles of the lungs. And that's specific, right? Does a bronchoscopy, does it look at in the individual alveoli? Well, no, there's nothing about alveoli and bronchoscopy. Um, so really have a good understanding of the basic medical terminology, you know, bronchoscopy um, and, and other types of you know, modalities. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, definitely identify some of the major um, consequences of trauma. Uh, for example, uh, be able to compare and contrast things like pericardial tamponade and a pneumothorax, right? Um, again, you know, a tamponade and a pneumothorax can present with some similar signs and symptoms, you know, tachycardia, uh, dyspnea, jugular venous distension, but what are the real cardinal things that can help us differentiate between those two things? Um, and a, a lot of, you know, if you're able to successfully compare and contrast things that have similarities, and you're able to identify the cardinal findings that segregate these different types of pathophysiology or pathology, you should do just fine um, on the examination. Um, obviously, you're going to have a little bit of obstetrical, gynecological issues. I would definitely be able to identify the cardinal findings for um, vaginal bleeding that occurs. 
you know, uh, when did, for example, spontaneous abortions, or when do they occur? They occur early, right? They, are, uh, they occur early on in the pregnancy, and the common cause of first trimester bleeding. However, if I have vaginal bleeding in the third, the end of the second or the third trimester, there are probably very different things occurring, such as um, abruptual placenta, uh, placenta previa, and what are the cardinal findings? You know, placenta previa, for example, is typically painless, whereas abruptio placente um, is typically painful and associated with uh, trauma of the pregnant patient. And then obviously there are going to be some basic things that are going to sneak in. So, you know, things like um, gravid moms who are supine, you know, what might they be presenting with? Well, you know, there's always, you know, the supine hypotensive syndrome, and, and how does that really happen? Um, and you're, you're going to have to go beyond basic uh, what you learned as a basic EMT or an EMT, and and recognize that now they're wanting you to be they, they they're going to want they're going to re require that you have a better understanding of the pathophysiology that's occurring and and instead of oh well the the baby's on the 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 uh, inferior vena cava and um, the heart isn't getting blood you're going to have to now um, dive into that a little deeper and go, well, what's really going on is, you know, the compression of the vena cava is um, decreasing preload to the heart, right? Um, the right side of the heart preloads a left ventricle, and that subsequently causes a decrease in overall cardiac output. So being able to look into the pathophysiology in a lot more depth um, will help you immensely to get through this examination. Um, also, um, things like neurology, you know, there's a big push now for pre-hospital stroke assessment. So I definitely know, you know, how do I assess stroke and assess, um, head injuries? You know, what are the, the major things that I assess? Uh, the, all the different stroke scales have some very common things that, you know, we assess, you know, facial droop, how can they speak, you know, arm drift. Um, things like that are very important when we do stroke assessment and, and being able to uh, compare and contrast the different types of intracranial bleeding. You know, subarachnoid hemorrhage versus a subdural hemorrhage versus an epidural hemorrhage. And there are um, very characteristic or classic um, textbook findings, you know, that can differentiate an epidural hematoma from a subdural. And um, instead of just saying, oh, an epidural hematoma has a lucid interval, you know, rote memorization, you may get a scenario where it is a complicated scenario that you read and you're going to have to identify, oh, that's what a lucid interval is. That patient had a lucid interval and, and okay, this, this makes sense. This is epidural and that it is the middle meningeal artery that has been compromised as an arterial bleed versus a subdural, um, you know, which may be a shearing injury and I tear bridging veins and I have a venous bleed. Um, so that's the level of complexity that you may run into on some of these questions. So, you know, definitely be, again, going back to being able to compare and contrast things um, will help you out quite a bit. Um, definitely study the 2010 guidelines for CPR and emergency cardiac care, okay? You're going to get those PLS questions and they may be simple things like foreign body airway obstruction and you know that we do things a little differently now the 2010 guidelines so definitely look at those 2010 guidelines refresh yourself because they will hit you with the 2010 America Heart Association guidelines and that includes adult pediatric and neonatal they're very spe special things right for example, um, a pediatric patient with a heart rate of less than 60, um, or 60 or less, what do we do? Well, we need to be doing CPR in those patients because they are rate dependent primarily for cardiac output, right? That's a little different from adults. So having a very good understanding of BLS uh, obviously help you out on this exam. Um, okay, guys, uh, we're right at about the 14 minute mark, a little more than 14 minutes, so I think I'm gonna cut it off here. And I'll continue my overview um, in subsequent videos. As always, thanks for hanging in there, guys.